This video was sponsored by Brilliant. I have a discount for you to try them out at the end of the video, so stick around. Hey, happy Friday. Huawei just started their annual developer conference yesterday, and they've announced a ton of really important things that I think flew completely under the radar. So I decided that this week I'll dedicate all three of my new slots to talking about Huawei. First, Huawei finally gave details on how they plan to bring Harmony OS 2.0 over to smartphones. Then they explained how they plan to lure app developers over to their platforms. And finally, the company also lost access to even more key suppliers. This time, Samsung Display, LG Display, and even chip maker SMIC. So those are the news we'll cover. As always, there's also a brand new weekly tech knowledge quiz for you to geek out on and test your technology on. So that is linked down in the description. And welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, my pick of the week is going to be major announcements around Huawei's very own operating system called Harmony OS. Harmony OS 2.0 just launched as a beta on Huawei's Internet of Things devices like their smart TVs and smartwatches and the like, and the company also announced that starting December, they would also bring it to phones for the first time ever, with an actual Harmony OS powered phone being launched next year. Now, what exactly that means is a bit of a question mark in my head because the way Huawei describes Harmony OS isn't really how you and I think about operating systems. It's apparently not just a piece of software that runs on a single device, but rather a distributed operating system. The way Huawei puts it is that multiple Harmony OS devices, like let's say your phone, your smartwatch, and your smart TV, they'd all connect to each other and share resources to act as multiple devices running one system. In other words, there's one system that has multiple multiple screens, multiple batteries, multiple microphones, multiple cameras, and so on. So the examples they gave were, for example, a learning app that runs on a tablet and a TV at once. So you can watch a video feed on the TV while you use the tablet to draw. And this is not going through the internet. It's apparently just one app being shared between the two devices real time through standard APIs. Or another one is a whiteboard app with a projector and multiple phones connected and interacting and drawing and such. And not through the internet again, but by the app itself running across multiple devices at once. These devices would then have a distributed file system that they share among themselves, which means that the app could, for example, save files into one device and read files from another and mix and match. And it could also access inputs and outputs like microphones, cameras, displays, loudspeakers on any of these devices at will. Sounds kind of esoteric, but also really interesting. Now, I don't believe that mainstream Harmony OS smartphones are just around the corner. After all, they don't run Android apps, at least not without significant modifications, so they don't really have an ecosystem to speak of. And Huawei is pushing their Android ecosystem way too hard for this to just come out and replace all of that next year. But still, very exciting. Okay, my one of the week will be the two new strategies Huawei has developed to bring app developers over from the Google Play Store to their Huawei app gallery ever since they were banned from the Play Store. Strategy one is to identify regional and local app makers that struggle against a bigger global giant. The four that they have identified were Dutch TomTom, which fights against Google Maps, Russian Sparebank, which wants to take on Google Pay, Estonian Bolt versus Uber, and Filipino Kumu versus Twitch, I guess. These app makers have a really tough time fighting against the traditional giants, especially when they're trying to take on built-in OS level features that come from Google. And by porting their stuff over to Huawei's ecosystem, Huawei makes them a preferred partner, at least within their own niche, and gives them a lot of free promotion, both in the App Store and sometimes even offline. Strategy two is what Huawei calls the HMS Go Global Alliance, which is basically a set of services Huawei will offer that should help Chinese apps to go global and global apps to break into the Chinese market using Huawei phones. These services include localization and helping with legal compliance and marketing abroad, both into and out of China. And they list companies like the Emirates, Agoda and AirAsia as companies that have already taken advantage of it. And to me, this all sounds like Huawei basically saying, hey, if you are a small fish on a big platform trying to fight giants like Google, why don't you come over to our platform instead and we will make you the giant on our platform and we'll even give you free promotion and a lot of services like legal compliance and translation and stuff like that. 
That would still be an uphill battle for the ecosystem, but it sounds better than nothing, I guess. And yet, I think it all might still not matter in the end, because the fail of the week is that the US has dealt two more gigantic blows to Huawei that I think might be big and serious enough to actually take the company down. First, Samsung and LG will have to stop supplying displays to Huawei starting on the 15th of September as they both use so-called DDICs, or the display driver chips, which were made partially using US technologies. We don't quite know just how devastating this would be to Huawei because theoretically there are Chinese display manufacturers like BOE, for example, that Huawei could fall back on. But the thing is that apparently two Korean companies manufacture about 90% of all DDICs worldwide. So it's very likely that even companies like BOE buy chips from them and they would be subject eventually to the same kind of pressure as well. Huawei quietly got into making DDICs themselves just last month, probably because they were expecting that something like this would happen. But even that might not be enough because band number two might keep them from making chips altogether. After losing access to Taiwanese chip companies including TSMC and MediaTek, the US is apparently looking to enforce a ban that would cut SMIC, domestic Chinese chip maker SMIC, from making chips as well. The US claims that SMIC worked in cooperation with the Chinese military and will not be allowed to use any US tech going forward, which seems like it would completely cripple their manufacturing process. SMIC of course said they didn't do it, but it looks like they're gonna get banned anyway. And with that, I think Huawei is pretty much out of options, unless the US lifts trade sanctions, of course. They can't buy off-the-shelf chips from companies like MediaTek or Samsung, for example. They can't manufacture chips themselves. And they can't even have other companies, including domestic chip manufacturers like SMIC, make those chips for them. And that's pretty much game over for a hardware company. Some type of microprocessor is at the heart of every single Huawei product. And if you'd like to understand how they work, not just have a rough idea, but really truly understand how they work, I recommend checking out the fantastic courses over at Brilliant. They have courses on topics like computer memory, for example, that walk you through the theory and the basics of memory storage step by step, all the way to actual concrete applications like caching, explaining the trade-offs between various memory types like DRAM, SRAM, and CPU caches. Each course breaks down really large, complex topics into small, manageable lessons, together with memorable examples, a quiz to drive each concept home, and Brilliant gives you a community of thousands of other students to chat with if you ever get stuck. There's a huge array of courses on computer science, maths, physics, engineering, and more, and with daily challenges and a phone app, you can even squeeze in a little bit of learning in just a few minutes a day while you are commuting or waiting for something to happen. And um, did I mention that they are fun? Brilliant has a free version, and at brilliant.org slash TFC, which is of course also linked down in the description, the first 200 people to sign up for a premium annual subscription will get 20% off. So check it out, get learning, and I'll see you in the next video.